What's up everybody, my name is Gobzi, and welcome back to another episode of Umaneko When They Cry Questions Arc. I'm just going to say at the beginning of this episode that this episode might be a little jankier than others because I'm recording this at a pretty inopportune time, but I didn't record this episode in advance, so sadly I have to record it at an inopportune time. Yeah, I could go a day without posting a video, but it's like I don't want to do that, especially since my... Subscriber count is getting steadily slightly higher. Obviously, it's not going like in leaps and bounds. I'm still getting about as many views as I usually do with these three series I'm doing right now. So, yeah, it's not any different. It's just I want to be consistent so I can keep that small growth going. So, anyways, last episode, um, Maria found a letter and she read it to us. And that's about all that I remember. Uh, people are probably going to die this episode, so if you don't like bloody things, stop watching this this series. Because people die. And, yeah, people die. It's a when they cry game, what do you expect? Regardless, let's get into this. The strange letter that the witch had entrusted to Maria wiped all memories of dinner from our minds. Maria was repeatedly barraged with questions by Aunt Rosa and the other parents. I'm going to move my microphone closer to me. Simply because this might have better, um, this might sound better, so we'll test this out. And became increasingly ill-tempered when they refused to believe her. If we kids tried to butt in, they'd probably ignore us. Our parents were all stirred up, firing back and forth about the gold and the distribution of the assets, and completely forgetting that we were even there. Yeah, that doesn't work, okay. I'd already guessed they'd been talking like this in the shadows. I don't want to keep on using my, uh, key, so I'm gonna try to use the mouse now. I'd already guessed that they'd been talking like this in the shadows, but I hadn't thought they'd be so blunt. It gave us all, ki it gave all of us kids a considerable shock. From what we could overhear, all the parents wanted more money as soon as possible. Back and forth about grandfather's inheritance. Back and forth about the distribution of the gold if it was found about advance payments and cash. It was so despicable I could hardly bear to watch, even though one of them was my father. It looked like Jessica felt the same way. We left our seats without being asked to and went to hang out somewhere well away from our parents. I get it. Now I totally see why Grandfather hates coming down for meals. I'm so disillusioned with her parents right now. All that about money and the inheritance? How can they act like that right out in the open? Well, I'm already completely disillusioned with my old bastard. There's no way I could think any worse of him. <laughs> that's the exact. That's exactly the same for me. Still, that freaking shocked me. Shocked me to the core. Jessica looked down at the floor, irritated. She was always talking about how bad her parents were, but maybe she real hadn't really felt that way deep inside. The depths of Jessica's shock made that clear. You're all minors being supported by your parents, so you might not understand. But getting money is neither a simple nor a pretty thing. I won't try to force you to understand right now, since you're still kids. But even so, I want you to realize that your parents are just doing their best in their own way. Oh great, George has gotten all mature. George, I know you're working hard as a full-fledged member of society, but does that mean you turn into a shameless, greedy vulture like our parents whenever you start talking about money and assets? If it were only for my own benefit, then no, I wouldn't want to do that. However, when your family and your employees, your subordinates and their families are all counting on you, there are some times when you must fight. I hate that kind of fight. That back and forth about grandfather's inheritance just makes me want to puke. Jessica pretended to spit violently. <laughs> it's an Old West movie out here. Jessica pretended... Oh, duh. That harsh reaction made the depths of her pain very clear. Let's stop talking about this. All this about grandfather's hidden gold, property, and inheritance is our parents' problem, not ours. I agree. At the very least, I think children have a duty to be considerate and stay out of their parents' way when they're talking together. Tch, sounds pretty boring. Everyone knows the phrase, adults are filthy. But we had now seen that for ourselves. And that really did give us a considerable shock. George was now pretty much an adult, and I'd already been disillusioned with my dad, so the shock wasn't that big for us. But Jessica seemed to be taking it hard. It's hard to use my mouse without getting the cursor on the screen. I don't know if you can see the cursor, but I'm trying to not get it on the screen. 
So I'm sorry, we're gonna go back to the quickie quickie sound of my mechanical keyboard. Apparently, she'd received a bigger blow than I'd thought. She always talks badly about her parents, but it looks like she hadn't changed at all on the inside. Even now, she's still a pure-hearted, delicate person who can't doubt others. I'm sure she respected her parents as much as anyone else does. And then her parents started raging about going, Money, money, inheritance, inheritance, my money! Right in front of all the other parents and the children. It's no surprise that she received such a shock from hearing that. Jessica, please don't start hating your mother and father. I won't ask you to understand them, but at least don't hate them. I get it, just leave me alone for a bit. Six years ago, I would have kept taunting Jessica even after she got all dejected. But I guess I really have grown over the last six years. I realized it'd be better to leave Jessica alone right now. Okay, I'm just gonna check and see. Okay, we're at six minutes. So that means uh, about an hour from now it'll be 5.30. That's a good time, I guess. Jessica suddenly looked away sulkily and left the parlor. She probably wanted to be alone for a while. Yeah, that would make sense. She just said she wanted to. I could do nothing but wordlessly watch her back as she left. Come to think of it, I wonder where Maria went. She's probably pouting in front of the portrait. Maria truly looked up to witches, and she'd expected that coming in direct contact with Beatrice and receiving the letter as proof would surprise everyone and make them happy. However, the adults had doubted its authenticity, thoroughly bombarding Maria with questions and refusing to accept her story. Even for me, it wasn't hard to imagine how much that must have hurt Maria. We couldn't speak to Maria or Jessica. In the end, George and I just abandoned ourselves to the night of the falling rain in the dark night. Sound of the falling rain in the dark night, rather. I wonder what's happening with that typhoon. Maybe there's something about it on the news. Oh boy, the clock's going crazy. George started walking over to the corner of the parlor where the television was. He hadn't called me over, and I really couldn't have cared less where the typhoon was on the sea now. So without going over to the television, I loitered around the window. Oh, it's Kyrie. Hello, you don't talk much, do you? The wind hasn't picked up that much here, but I wonder if it's horrible over the sea. I did hear about a severe storm warning on the weather report. Ah, Kyrie. I take it those big talks between the adults are going smoothly, yeah? She seemed to catch the sarcasm. Kyrie shrugged. I wonder if that stomachache of discussion will continue all night. It's not going to be fun. Well then, please enjoy playing vultures to grandfather's property as much as you'd like. I feel sick. I'll agree with you on that. If I could just slip away like you, I'd do it. Unfortunately, I can't. Even if I'm not allowed to speak. We spouses have it pretty rough, too. Kyrie took a deep breath, smiling bitterly. That's right. They probably wouldn't let Kyrie speak, since she only married into the family. Still, as Dad's partner, she's had no choice but to stay by his side and support him. She's probably had to bear the full brunt of this mental pressure much more than me. I wasn't going to apologize, but realizing that I'd spoken too harshly, I cut the sarcasm for the time being. So how does it look? Are they still stuck on the topic of the mysterious witch Beatrice? More or less. Those four siblings are always piling up secret agreements when they come together to discuss the division of Grandfather's inheritance. They're saying that some unknown fifth person has appeared and is trying to make things even more complicated, and there's no way that'll make for a peaceful conversation. Just when you think they're snarling at each other, they'll set up a common front. Nazi he's not the only one getting headaches. On the, on the one hand, they all want a larger portion than the other siblings, so they're all rivals. I don't know if she's still talking, but we'll assume she is. On the one hand, they all want a larger portion than the other siblings, so they're all rivals. But on the other hand, they don't want one yen to be snatched up by anyone other than the siblings, so they're all also allies. I hadn't been told the details, but the siblings were apparently discussing how to protect their shares under various situations. Setting up ceasefire agreements and rules to prevent anyone from getting an unfair advantage. Even preparing to resort to legal action if absolutely necessary. That they would go this far to per preserve their shares was so beyond disgusting that you just had to re acknowledge their resilience. So basically, Beatrice is like an assassin sent by grandfather. He probably wanted to scare the hell out of his children for talking about the inheritance without him. Yeah. <laughs> Who is this Beatrice, I wonder? Oh, that's a new pose. Is she a Danganronpa character all of a sudden? No, that's wrong. If, if everything she claims is true, then she's a mystery figure that no one knew about until today. And she also knows about Grandfather's hidden gold. On top of that, she was even entrusted with the head's ring. She must truly have been trusted by him. Well, obviously, I don't think she's a witch riding around on a broom. 
But there's no doubt she's a mysterious person who's earned the right to be called a witch. If only Maria would go into more detail about that. Everyone's been smothering her even though she's just a little girl. They really scared her. And some things they might have asked now can't be asked. I wonder if those people have ever even read The North Wind and the Sun. What we do know is that Maria received a letter from a person who took the name Beatrice. She sure is shy for a mystery person, and trusting Maria with a letter and hiding away even now when she could have just appeared and talked to us directly. Ha 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 Hey, Battler. Do you really think a person called Beatrice actually exists? Who knows? Doesn't it really seem like a false name? Like she's grandfather's representative, so she was given permission to take the name of the witch from his delusions? No, that's not what I meant. Right now, there's a total of 18 people here on Rokanjima. Do you think there's a 19th person? Are there really a full 18 people on this island right now? Wondering about that, I began counting on my fingers, and it really did come out to that many. Damn. Do I think that a 19th person exists? What exactly do you mean? Just what I said. The person who lent Maria that umbrella supposedly wasn't one of us 18. So isn't it natural to assume that a 19th person exists and that this person lent Maria the umbrella? Obviously, whoever gave her the umbrella is just saying, Yeah, no, I didn't do it. Lol. You're, I'm not gonna cause the deaths of all of you and fake my own. Not at all. Obviously, I don't know who that person is. I've only seen the Umaneko anime, which just covers questions arc. But not the answers arc, so... When we get there, I'm gonna have some huge mindfucks. Um, well, yeah, it sure looks that way. Then where exactly is this person now? At the very least, she must have been on the island when it started raining. And ever since that time, the weather has grown progressively worse, so taking a boat out would be pretty much impossible. In that case, that person must still be on the island, hiding from the rain somewhere, and without any of us spotting her. True, we've all been randomly prowling around all over the mansion and the guest house, but no one has bumped into a 19th person. But this island is huge. There might be other places to take shelter from the rain, other than the mansion and the guest house. At about this time, I began to realize what direction Kyrie's suspicions were taking us in. Kyrie was denying that a 19th person existed. Beatrice was one of us 18. In other words, she thought someone we knew well was tricking us. If Beatrice is who she claims, she would surely be the most honored of guests, the most honored of conf confidants, trusted by Grandfather. There's no way Grandfather wouldn't give that kind of person a warm reception. She would surely have been ushered into the mansion. However, we haven't seen anyone like that. Wait a sec, isn't this line of reasoning a bit too hasty? Sure, no one spotted this person, but that doesn't mean you can deny the possibility that a 19th person exists, right? Maybe, for some reason, they landed on the island stealthily and have been hiding ever since. It's what they call a devil's proof. It's easy to prove that something exists. If this Beatrice appears in front of us and says hi, then it's settled. But it's impossible to prove that there's... It's impossible to prove that there's no 19th person. Yes. Battler, your way of reasoning isn't bad. In our current situation, there isn't enough information to either accept or deny that a 19th person exists. Why are we getting into mystery bullshit when no one is dead, okay? But if you spin the chessboard around and think that way, we can deny the existence of a 19th person with near certainty. Spin the chessboard around- Oh well, wait, spin the chessboard around was one of Kyrie's favorite phrases. I've been, I I've been influenced by those words and use them myself from time to time. Kyrie does seem like a pretty influential and level-headed person, at least. Unlike other people in the family, yada yada Eva, yada yada Natsuhi, yada yada Kraus, yada yada Kinzo, etc. A g fucking Gota, even though he's not part of the family, he's an awful person. When you get stuck trying to find a move in chess or shogi, then by spinning the board around and looking at everything from your opponent's standpoint, you can often see a strategy that'll give you the upper hand. It means turning things around and putting yourself in your opponent's shoes. You see? Let's say that a 19th person called Beatrice actually exists. That person must have managed, without being seen by anyone, to stealthily arrive on this island and remain hidden ever since. Maybe they had some reason, okay? In that case, why did they go to all of the trouble of appearing before Maria and... Of... Bef Fuck! <laughs> I can't read at all! What the hell is reading? I don't know. In that case, why did they go to all of the trouble of appearing before Maria and handing her the letter? It really was a contradiction. If they had some reason for hiding themselves, then they should have stayed hidden the whole time. But even so, 
they had appeared openly in front of Maria. Then, wait, Maria said it herself. She said the witch made her a messenger. Maybe that's because Maria was the youngest and looked the most obedient. Why would they need a messenger? If they just wanted a letter delivered to the family conference, they could have mailed it. If they mailed it to each of the four siblings, no one would be able to ignore it. There was no need for this person to carry it themselves and secretly deliver it by hand. Yeah. Oh, fuck. Yeah, that does sound pretty weird. Okay, we're good now. In the first place, if Beatrice existed and wanted to make her presence known to everyone, then she could have just openly presented herself to all of us. Despite that, she chose the vague method of appearing through a little girl called Maria, and only gave us a vague impression of who she was. Contradiction. Let's go a little deeper, shall we? She appeared in front of Maria, trying to give us the impression that a 19th person existed, and yet, she still hasn't appeared before us and is hiding somewhere at this very moment. Think about those contradictions. You've got to keep these things in mind when you spin the chessboard around. I don't know if they ever said this, but I'm starting to get the idea that Kyrie is potentially a detective. I don't know 100% for sure, but she's either a detective or like a psychology professor or something like that. In short, if a person wants to leave us with the impression that Beatri Beatrice exists as the 19th person, what might their goal be? If this person wanted to hide, then they wouldn't have made their presence known. And if they wanted to show themselves, they wouldn't have used the roundabout approach of entrusting someone with a letter. Which means... It's simple. Beatrice is one of the 18 people. That's why they want to create the illusion that there are more than 18 people. The 19th person was revealed so spectacularly. If someone were to profit from this, it wouldn't be some 19th person in hiding. It'd be one of the original 18 people. Of course, this reasoning is full of holes. If you turn over even a few of its premises, it'll simply fall apart. But I'm almost completely certain it's correct. H how does that have holes in it? I, I don't really see that. This is starting to feel pretty creepy. Someone lent Maria the umbrella and handed her the letter. Supposedly, none of the 18 did this. And yet, Beatrice was hidden among those 18. Given the fact that Beatrice has blonde hair, like b reddish blondish hair from that picture, you'd think the only people who would be able to pass off as Beatrice in Maria's eyes are like Jessica or Eva, but I don't know how either of those could do that. What was this person planning? Hiding their true form and pretending to be Beatrice? I suspected it might have been Maria play acting, but the contents of the message were extremely complicated, and it's hard to imagine Maria writing that herself. However, I can't deny the possibility that Maria is working together with someone. Or it could be Rosa, since Rosa is her mom, after all. Wait a sec. Maria's a nine-year-old kid, right? What could she possibly be planning, and with whom? And what about her straightforward, overly honest, obedient nature? Yes, I also understand what kind of a person Maria is. Okay, assuming... Like, if I was just playing through the game at this point and didn't have any knowledge of what happens after all this, I would definitely be saying, yeah, blah blah blah, Rosa, duh. But that's exactly why I think it's possible. That girl's a dreamer who can't help but look up to and blindly accept the existence of witches. So if a person appeared in front of her and claimed to be the witch Beatrice, Maria would happily swallow it up, I think. So you're saying that if someone disguised themselves by wearing that fancy dress from the portrait, tricking Maria wouldn't be that hard? Of course, with that reasoning, all of us women would become the primary suspects. Anyway, who did Maria encounter? Learning the details of that question would be the best key to solving this riddle. But this key has been firmly locked away inside Maria's heart. Everyone denied the existence of the witch without listening to her, barraging her too much with questions about who Beatrice actually was. She probably won't open her heart to the adults now. Huh. What color eyes does Beatrice have? I never quite caught that. Was it like... Red-ish? In that case... Um, let's look at all the people. Who has red-ish eyes? Natsuhi, potentially. Not Jessica. Eva has purple eyes. Kyrie, no. Maria has purple eyes. Ro Rosa, oh fuck. <laughs> Alright, blue, blue, and then, uh, I can't really tell, but that's brown-ish, so. Yeah. So I think that works, uh, Rosa would be the prime suspect in that case. In the dim hall in front of the portrait of Beatrice, Maria was sobbing. Eh, eh, no one believes I met Beatrice. Eh, eh. 
Even though I showed them the letter Beatrice gave, they still don't believe. Oh. <laughs> Damn. People upset and crazy in this fucking place of a mansion on Rokenjima. Anyway, Maria Chan. Oh, fuck, I said the Chan part. I figured I was eventually gonna screw that up. I went a few episodes without doing that, but look at that! I fucked up! Good job, people who wanted me to say the honorifics. Anyway, Maria's holding the key. The key to whether Beatrice is one of the 18 people, or a 19th person. Maria's stubborn, right? When that girl gets angry, it's pretty hard to make her feel better. Battler, I think a kid like you would be better at cheering her up than an adult like me. After she's feeling better, try asking. I know you don't care about all this back and forth about the inheritance, but don't you find this Western Mansion mystery situation exciting? Who in the world is this person who gave Maria the letter? It makes your intellectual curiosity ache. Kyrie's eyes are orange. I, I, I'd have to see exactly what color Beatrice's eyes are, because I don't know for sure. You're actually pretty tough, considering you're still excited after being dragged through that endless money talk. Adults can be pretty amazing. I shrugged exasperatedly. But I did notice something. Kyrie noticed how dejected I was after overhearing our parents' turbulent discussion, and was probably trying to clear the air. At the very least, I'd recovered enough to voice my complaints. She wasn't my real mother, so I've never felt like calling her mom. But it did make me think she's a real adult. Hey brat, so this is where you were. Kyrie, you really, t you really took your time fixing your makeup, didn't you? Think I'll make a habit of going out to touch up my makeup, too. I'm sorry, a woman's makeup takes a long time. So? How's the discussion been without me? <laughs> I'm sure everything was all peaceful and harmonious. Kyrie poked the weak spot under my arm with her elbow. <laughs> Ow, that hurt. We decided to take a break to cool our heads a little. It looks like we'll be at it all night. Makes me want to cry. His way of talking hadn't changed, but he couldn't completely hide his fatigue. I couldn't say I was sympathetic, but he looked pitiful compared to his normal energetic self. Still, that rain's just awful. I really don't want to go back to the guest house. It looks like Natsuhi set things up so we could spend the night here in the mansion. What do we do? We don't need to decide until you're done, right? If you run so low on energy that you can't return to our room, then we can't then we can take them up under offer. You're right. We can think about it later. What about you, Batler? If I stayed I'd just get in the way. I'll be nice and go back over there. I see. Will you go back soon? I don't know. It'd be lonely to head back by myself. I'll gather all the kids and we'll head out. Okay, you go do that. Also, Battler, you won't be going to sleep that easily tonight, right? Yeah, I'll probably be up talking with the cousins. Sounds like we'll be up all night. Is there a problem with that? I see. If you're still awake when the adults' discussion is over, I want to have a little talk as a family. A what? That doesn't sound like you. Apparently, Kyrie was thinking the same thing. What are you talking about? She asked him in a small voice. It looked like Kyrie didn't have a clue what Dad meant either. I also want to talk to you about it, Kyrie. I'll tell you later, so don't ask now. Please. <laughs> I don't know anyone who neglects the concept of family as much as this old bastard. And now he's saying we're gonna have a talk as a family. Both Kyrie and I couldn't help but get wide-eyed. Don't look so terrified. I'm the one who should be terrified. After all. At that point, he swallowed his words for an instant. Even though putting on airs of importance wasn't much like my dad. You're freaking me out, Dad. Everyone in our family's gathered here now, right? Don't make a big deal out of it and spit it out. Tonight, I will probably be killed. Uh-oh. There was a huge crash of thunder. Must have been really close. Dad's expression, brightly illuminated by the lightning, was burned into my eyes. Dad's face, which always looked so sure of itself and which always wore a taunting expression, was strangely frail in a way I couldn't really explain. It was so worn out that he looked like a different person. What? What are you talking about? That doesn't sound like you. <laughs> I agree. What happened? You look so timid all of a sudden. It's not like you. I'm gonna go fix my makeup, too. Don't follow me. Dad turned away, weakly. After that, only Kyrie and I were left, still wide-eyed. What did he say? Tonight, he'll be killed? You don't think that mysterious letter scared him, do you? 
He's been watching too many serial murder mo serial murder movies. Hmm. Kyrie didn't answer my lighthearted words and continued to stare at my dad's disappearing back. Battler, when you told Rudolph to spill the beans right away, he left without telling us anything. Even though he said he had something to say to both of us, he didn't answer you. Why? Spin the chessboard around. What do you see? Well, when he, he when he said he wanted to talk but then couldn't, that's a contra contradiction. What, can you see something by looking from Dad's perspective? <laughs> yes, I can see something. He wants to talk about something. However, he doesn't have the courage to bring it up. So he actually means chase after me, talk to me, and ask me about it yourself. By saying don't follow me, he actually means the opposite. He actually means follow me and force me to answer. Seriously, what a spoiled brat. What? Can you really call that reasoning? That's ridiculous. <laughs> can great privilege and- Fuck. Can great private and police detectives deduce the emotions and feelings between men and women? They can't, right? Figuring out the feelings of the opposite sex is even more advanced- is an even more advanced art than exposing the tricks in difficult crime cases. Yeah, she's definitely a detective. If you ask me, romance novels have much deeper mysteries than masterpiece mystery novels. I see. Is that how it is? I'll stand alongside that spoiled brat. He normally loves to bluff, but tonight he's completely tired out from that heated discussion. He probably wants someone to lean, in, lean on at the moment. To lean on at the moment, rather. And responding to that need is the role of his partner. Ha! Sounds passionate. Then I'll leave that old bastard in your hands. Yes, leave it to me. I called out to Kyrie's departing back. Huh? What? Um, I wanted to say thanks. Thanks to you, my gloomy mood has cleared up a lot. That's good. Communication is important. Yeah, she good person. After answering with a wink, Kyrie followed after Dad. Okay. You guys ready to see people die? Even though it's not happening yet, and at this rate, probably not this episode even. <laughs> if we go eight episodes, eight hours, without people dying, that's probably not a very good thing. Natsuki so could be found in a dimly lit hallway. Now and then, the thunder would crash, but this had no effect on her expression. She looked completely worn out. The discussion that had just taken place between the relatives in the dining hall was repeating itself inside Natsuhi's mind. Oh fuck, if we get a fucking flashback to the- oh my fuck! <laughs> Beatrice had proclaimed that in addition to the gold, all of the inheritance and property of the Uchiromiya family would be given to the person who could solve the riddle. In other words, she planned to undermine the absolute guarantee that Kraus, as the oldest brother, had to succeed the family head. Originally, the other siblings had absolutely no chance to inherit the headship. To them, this proposal by Beatrice was extremely desirable. It was obvious that they would accept it. There was no need to play some clumsy detective game. Natsuhi knew that this so-called 19th person Beatrice couldn't exist. Naturally, Beatrice was nothing more than a fictional character used to pass a message that Kinzo had written himself. As proof, Kinzo had remained stubbornly neutral as to that letter's authenticity. He was completely ignoring these reckless claims that he shouldn't be able to ignore, that he had given up the head's ring. In short, Kinzo had wordlessly admitted that the letter held his own message. Most likely, one of the servants had given Maria the letter. Kinzo had probably worked out from an elaborate plan where the dress from the portrait would be prepared. And someone, probably Shannon, would be made to wear it and deliver the letter and the umbrella. By doing that, he could make it seem like the witch from the portrait actually existed. No, if anything, that alone was proof that Kinzo was behind all of this. In that case, it was the same as Kinzo trying to butt in on the sibling's private discussion. Then Kinzo, by announcing that he'd give everything to the person who solved the riddle, could weaken Krause's overwhelming advantage. Yeah, that would make sense, I guess. Now it was certain. Kinzo had eavesdropped on the siblings' discussion in the parlor earlier that day. So he had known how, how Krause had staved off the attack by the other three. And to make the scales of the battle go back into balance, he had sent out this strange letter, which benefited Krause's rivals. He was trying to push this crazy theory so that Rosa, who had a weak position among the siblings be because of her age, would join with Eva and Rudolph. Then, with a 3 to 1 advantage, they'd be able to- they'd- Okay, that's a grammar error. They'd be able to overwhelm Kraus yet again, and make the ridiculous theories get accepted by force. And by doing that, he gave them the power to resettle what had once been a nearly decided conflict. They had now started repeatedly pressing Kraus to pay them a large amount of money. Using the condition that all of the siblings would guarantee Krause's position as the successor, 
Talk about advanced payments was... Wait. Yeah, talk about advanced payments was being brought up again, despite having been rejected once. Of course, even without the story about the hidden gold, the Ushiromiya family's store of wealth was vast. That store of wealth alone was more than enough. Even if the hidden gold was buried forever, oh fuck. Even if the hidden gold was buried forever along with Kinzo's death, there would be more than enough to satisfy. Therefore, even if they weren't that interested in the gold itself, Kinzo had managed to instill the lifelong fear that on the off chance that someone found the gold, that person would be granted the headship. And this kind of Achilles heel would definitely be taken advantage of by someone sooner or later. The only person with this fatal weakness was the successor, Kraus. The other siblings had found. No, they had been told by Kinzo about something that only Kraus could lose, and they had thoroughly taken advantage of that. Natsuhi, as Kraus's only ally in this painful position, and as his wife wanted to fight alongside him. She kept trying to explain to him that the existence of the gold itself was a farce, and that there was no need for him to compromise. Kraus had always told Natsuhi. He had told all of the siblings. He always, always said that the hidden gold was nothing more than an illusion created by Kenzo. Therefore, Natsuhi had believed it as his wife, and had supported her husband on that foundation. Even so, Natsuhi's words didn't reach Kraus. Even though Natsuhi had fought so hard and had lent all of her strength, he continued to fight by himself and was trying to compromise with the other three siblings. Natsuhi sadly and weakly wondered why she could not be of use to him, then started getting angry. Dun dun! It had happened when everyone decided to take a short break to cool their heads. Natsuhi had flared up against Kraus. In rage, she had asked why she could not be useful to him. He had then told her that he wanted to talk about something, and invited her into a room that she was n normally not allowed to enter. That room had been sealed with a heavy looking padlock, and just looking at it had given her an uncomfortable feeling. Well, okay. There's no need for you to worry about anything, any anything said by those three, or even the suspicious person who calls herself Beatrice. After all, the gold is just a ruse created by father. There's no way something like that could be found. Your position as a successor is a solid fact. What are you afraid of? Kraus removed the padlock on the door. He then motioned for Natsuhi to enter. Enter. W what is this? There's something I want you to see. I've never shown you this before. Is it the gold? Natsuhi timidly opened the door with a dubious expression on her face. It was pitch black. She searched for a switch to turn on the lights, but since this was her first time in the room, she didn't know where it was. Kraus entered behind her, pushing her in, and when he closed the door before turning on the lights, the two were swallowed up by the darkness. Only the sound of Kraus locking the door rang out through the dark. W what are you doing? Th the lights! I am turning them on now. Wait. Just as he said, when Kraus pushed the switch on the wall, a flickering light turned on and lit up the room. Th that is... Natsuhi he had her breath taken away. The room had no windows, and at a glance it appeared to be empty. In the middle of the room a small round table had been set, and the lights brightened only that table as if it were the leading part in a play. On top of the table, a red tablecloth of elaborate design had been set out, covered with dust. And on top of that, something about the size of a grown man's arm has been set down. That something took Natsuhi's breath away. A gold bar! Ooh, it's a gold ingot. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> this is supposed to be important, and I fuck up the word ingot. It's a gold ingot of incredible purity. Without this, no one would have believed in the legend of the gold. It was an ingot of solid gold. Even in the faint light, it sparkled with a noble and dignified glint. This is not a proper ingot. I don't even know whether it was cast inside or outside the country. It took a high level of skill to make the purest of solid gold ingots. And in order to verify that purity, it was standard to have the original foundry and the name of the bank that guaranteed it imprinted on the gold. However, this ingot did not have that kind of seal. This mysterious gold bar had come from an unknown foundry. Look here. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's just a bar of gold. Natsuhi, following Krause's words, timidly approached the ingot. Right there. Krause pointed at the surface of the ingot. Natsuhi concentrated on that section. Uh, the mark on the left? Right there was the thin imprint of the one-winged eagle crest. Ah! Natsuhi's breath was taken away once again. That's right. This is a legendary ingot that father said he received from the witch that the president of Maruso witnessed and was able- uh, 
and was allowed to select that random to take back with him. That gained the trust of the fixers in the business world. I had to use all possible means to find it. I found it before the other siblings could. How could... then... the legend of Father's Gold is... It actually exists! The gold that Ushiro Mia Kinzo received from Beatrice actually exists. Impossible! So, it really does exist. Natsu, he was shocked. Krause had always said that Kinzo's gold was just a fabrication. So, she had believed it as his wife. However, the reality was different. Since he held definite proof, he had been more certain than any of the other siblings that the legend of the gold was true. Because of this, Krause was deeply frightened at the possibility that someone other than himself would find the gold he'd failed to find, costing him everything. But to Natsuhi, this truth was more than enough to split open her heart. She had thought that, as Krause's wife, she should be his closest confidant, confidant, or fucking whatever, which was why she had selflessly supported him. And yet, he had hid this fact from her until today. Why? H have I been so undeserving of your trust? That has never been my intention. There was simply no need to tell you. I is that all a, a wife means to you? Calm down. Becoming passionate easily is one of your bad habits. You're the one who's making me like that, aren't you? I've been supporting you as a wife ever since I married into this family. For your sake, I threw away the family I was born into, and I've been offering up my heart and my body to serve you. And in return, this is what I get? How could... How could you? Krauss grimaced, looking annoyed. His expression effectively communicated how much he disliked this part of Natsuhi, even if he didn't say it out loud. It doesn't look like I will be of any use to you anymore. Hmm, that's fine. I can resolve the troubles with the siblings by myself. I don't need your help. That's wrong! This is the Ushiro Mia family's problem! It's true that I am not permitted to wear the family crest on my body, but I am still your wife! Even so, are you saying I'm not capable of helping you? Are you? Wait, fuck. <laughs> Even so, are you saying I'm not capable of helping you? Are you? I especially wouldn't want to risk getting you involved. It would probably make your headaches even worse than they are now. Take a rest for today. The siblings will deal with the siblings' problems. It has nothing to do with you. That is all. Damn. <laughs> I say damn after a lot of the scenes in this series. A dull headache tormented Natsuhi. No matter what medicine she took, no matter what sense she burned, it wouldn't heal. In fact, simply wandering alone through the dark corridors and listening to the sound of the rain seemed to be a better cure. I may be Natsuhi, but I was never Ushiro Mia Natsuhi. I I'll just say this in her voice. I have been despised and treated as a borrowed womb, and insulted when I couldn't even fill that role. Even so, I have tried to properly perform my duties as a wife, but now even my husband has rejected me. I've done my best raising my daughter, as if it were the last job left to me. However, I've had no release from my anger and sadness, and they've caused me to subconsciously strain that relationship too. Dreamer is now playing crosscode. I don't know if you can even see that. Because I've been excessively strict in Jessica's education, she dislikes me thoroughly. She despises me for having no interest in anything but grades. There is no longer anything I can do for the Ushromia family. No, that's no good. Despite it all, I must help my husband and beat back the schemes of the other greedy siblings. The family head won't be around much longer. Eventually, Krauss will succeed the head, and the next successor will be Jessica. Strictly speaking, the man who enters the family by marrying Jessica will become the next head, but it all comes to the same thing. I have to make Jessica an excellent successor, whom everyone will accept as worthy to take over the Ushiromiya family. In the days to come, that greedy Ushiromiya Eva will probably be plotting to find some fault with the main family. And if all goes as she plans, Jessica will be dragged down from the succession with George set up in her place. It is regrettable, but George is a man, and even more, he has matured as a person. Compared to Jessica, who is right in the middle of her rebellious period, and whose grades are slightly below average, and can be seen as a glance at a glance who is more fit to succeed the head. So in order to secure Jessica's position, I need to turn her into an excellent person. After doing that... I want to find her an excellent husband worthy of the excellent person she will have become. A wonderful man who will truly accept Jessica and stay with her through all of life's joys and sorrows. Was Natsuhi- wait. Was Natsuhi trying to entrust her daughter with fulfilling some desire of her own? Natsuhi thought back to the days when she'd had no choice but to marry into the Ushiromiya family, 
because of that unavoidable fate. She had tried to block that from her memory. She had consciously forgotten it, and had actively attended to the life she'd be ge been given as Ushiromi and Natsuhi. And in doing so, she had built up a new life. But just now, it felt like all of that had been casually rejected. How should I think as I live my life? I do not know. Natsuhi helplessly rested her head against the glass of the window. The glass, which was cool thanks to the raindrops beating against it, felt somehow refreshing, even though it should have been emotionless. Right then, it seemed to be the only thing that could understand Natsuhi. At that point, even if someone had appeared, Natsuhi didn't intend to pay any attention to them. But she did pay attention, because it was her beloved daughter. Oh boy. Oh, it's you, Mom. What the heck are you doing in a place like this? Thought you were a ghost. Just like always, her words were rough and not at all like a girl's. Instinctively, words of rebuke rose to Natsuhi's throat. However, their strength gave out, and they didn't escape her lips. Jessica, forgive me, but my headache is awful. Please leave me be. I see. Jessica was seeing her mother in a position of feebleness for the first time, so she was considerably disconcerted. Until just now, she'd been filled with contempt for all of the parents, including her mother. But now those feelings had been completely swept away. Her mother's utterly exhausted face had wiped them all out. In its place, the words George had told her told her floated Fuck! In its place, the words George had told her floated back up in her mind. Our parents are doing their best in their own way. And because their families are counting on them, and they can't afford to keep everything pleasant, and have a heavy responsibility to fight. Maybe her mother had been standing around in this dimly lit hallway because no one had tried to understand that part of her. Jessica hated her mother, so she had no intention of speaking kindly to Natsuhi just because she was looking a bit frail. So when she attempted to speak kindly to her mother anyway, she had to clench her fists and gather up the words from deep in her heart. It sounds like you really got your hands full with that meeting thing. It has nothing to do with you. Please go somewhere else. Is your headache bad? Sh should I go get some medicine? You don't have to trouble yourself. Please, leave me alone. Natsuhi wasn't being cold. She just wanted her daughter to go far away so that she wouldn't have to bump against Natsuhi's own short temper. But there was no chance that Jessica would realize this. Okay. Jessica hung her head, looking sad. Seeing that expression, Natsuhi recognized the kindness that Jessica was trying to muster. She gave her head a small shake to drive away her own unkind feelings. Then I'll leave. I'll be with the other cousins so I don't get in the way of the adults. See you later. Wait there. She called Jessica, who was trying to leave and looked lonely to a stop. What? Thank you for being so considerate. It isn't good of me to go to sleep and leave you alone. Don't talk like that, you'll bring bad luck. I've made you worried, but I'm okay now. I will go. If I let my daughter see me this feeble any longer, I'll only make her feel more uneasy. With that thought in mind, Natsuhi- Wait, with that thought in mind, Natsuhi left Jessica with words of gratitude and made to depart. This time, Jessica called out to her mother's back. Natsuhi stopped and turned around- Fuck! I keep on accidentally pressing that. Asking what business Jessica had with her. But Jessica herself didn't know why she'd stopped her mother. And for a while, she smiled wryly, muttering to herself as she hesitated over what to say. She was poking around in her pocket when her hand touched something and she took it out. Um, hey mom! I, uh, was given a charm today. What was it, a charm against magic? Um, er, I'm pretty sure that you were supposed to hang it from your doorknob, I think. Haha, <laughs> I forgot. There's no point in me having it, so I'll let you take it. It was a scorpion charm that Maria had given her on the beach. Although she'd heard of its various effects from Maria, Jessica's mind had gone blank, and she was just barely able to say even that much. Jessica, thinking that her mother probably wouldn't accept it anyway, immediately drew back the hand she had stuck out, grasping the charm. So when Natsuhi came back to take it, she was extremely shocked. What is this? Some kind of prize toy? Well, it's... I think it's something like that. I guess you wouldn't really expect a charm that looks like a toy to do anything. But her mother took the charm from where she grasped it in her hand. Thank you. I'll take good care of it. Sometime soon in exchange, why don't I give you a charm that was important to me when I was a child? It's not like I'm... It's not like that's why I gave it to you. But, well, if you really say so, then I will rest for now. My headache is awful. Try not to stay up too late. Sure. Natsuhi put the charm in her pocket and turned away. She then disappeared into the dark hall. 
<laughs> Didn't say damn this time, got it? Damn. Ah! I'm a funny person. It seems the weather will be like this all day tomorrow, after all. Dang, this makes the good weather we had earlier feel like a lie. George and I were killing time in front of the parlor television. At that point, Jessica returned. Her face was still blank, but it looked like she'd calmed down a little since we'd last seen her. Is Maria still in front of the portrait? Nope. She just came back and she's sweeping over there on the sofa. It's getting pretty late for her, after all. Looking at the clock, I saw it was a little past 10 p.m. Even if we were planning to stay up all night, it was about time to head back to our room. Well, my mom did have a room prepared for us in the mansion. What do we do? I'd rather head back to the guest house. Going by what we saw of our parents, I think it'd be better if we weren't in the mansion. I agree. Feels like they're telling us kids to mind our own business and stay out of their way. Let's be good little boys and girls and do that. Oh, <laughs> hi! As we were talking about this, Aunt Rosa came into the parlor. She was looking all over restlessly, probably trying to find Maria. Aunt Rosa, if you're looking for Maria, she's over there on the sofa. Thank you. My, she's out cold. We must move her to a bed. If you'd like, I'll carry her over to a bed. Thanks, that would be wonderful. Are you all heading back to the guest house? Or are you going to stay in the room Nazi he had prepared here? We were just talking about that. We just decided to head over to the guest house. I see. Then could I ask you to take Maria with you? I'd feel much more reassured if she stays with all of you cousins. Behind those words, she seemed to be concealing some regret that the adults, herself included, had deeply hurt Maria's feelings. Leave it to us, Aunt Rosa. After all, we do have an expert at comfort comforting Maria with us. Uh, are you talking about me? I couldn't do it myself. We'll need everyone together. That's right. Batler, weren't you the one who hit it off with Maria when you were messing around earlier? As we said this, Aunt Rosa smiled, looking truly happy. Thank you, everyone. It looks like our meeting will last until very late. So while I'm sorry to burden you like this, I'll be counting on you all to take care of Maria. Hey, Maria, are you sound asleep? We're going back to the guest house. Maria muttered something indistinct, rolled over, and fell back asleep. It looked like she was sleeping deeply. She's really out cold. I'd hate to wake her. Right, I'll carry her. Maria's body was much lighter than it looked. I lifted her up and put her on George's back. It was raining hard outside, and George couldn't hold an umbrella and carry Maria at the same time. It looked like Aunt Rosa would come with us as far as the guest house to help out. However, when she heard Uncle Krause's voice call out to her, she had no choice but to return. Now that's a problem. I have to go back now. Is everyone returning to the guest house? After we left the hall on the way to the entrance, the door to the servant room opened and Shannon stepped out. It has grown very dark, so allow me to guide you. That would be great, Shannon. George is going to carry Maria there. Could you hold an umbrella for him? Yes, certainly. Shannon brought umbrellas for each of us and a flashlight to guide the way. As we opened the front door, the downpour was quite terrific. It looked like we wouldn't have any spare time to take a pleasant walk and enjoy the nighttime rose garden. George, is she too heavy? Want me to carry her? It's okay. I can at least carry Maria. I'm truly grateful. Please take care of Maria. Sure, you got it. Then I guess this is good night, Aunt Rosa. Then I will see them over there and return here. Yes, please. Oh, fuck. That was a weird dilation in my voice. Is that the proper word? I don't fucking know. Aunt Rosa watched us leave. I'm surprised. It's been like 45 minutes and I haven't heard anything outside my room. So that's a good thing. Uh, Maria, I'm sorry for everything. Oh, that was Rosa. Maria, I'm sorry for everything. Rosa's mumbling voice didn't reach the person in question, nor any of the kids, but disappeared beneath the sound of the rain. I thought it was gonna do the crack thing. Like, you know, like the glass shatter. After cutting through the rainy rose garden, we arrived at the guest house. Uh, if only I had applied for the dis position of Maria Carrier, then I would have gotten a chance to have Shannon sh Shannon's huge boobs rubbing all over my arm. That's not why I did it. It's a misunderstanding. <laughs> I thought that if we didn't walk like this, George would get all wet. Come on, quit babbling and go in. After being urged on by Jessica, we folded up our umbrellas and went into the guest house. Now my dog's barking, so I guess I jinxed it. Has anyone gotten their clothes wet? I can bring some towels if you want. You don't need to worry about us that much. Thanks, Shannon. Ah, oh, that's right. We were planning to go play cards or something. Would you care to join us for a bit? Huh? We had the night shift on today's schedule. I believe we had a special schedule during the family conference. 
Also, I think a few alterations have been made, so I will go and check. Wait, if you have to go all the way back to the mansion to find out, don't force yourself. Oh, that's alright. I can find out from the servant room in the guest house. Please excuse me for a short while. Shannon gave a quick bow and went into the guest house servant room. The rest of us headed for the cousin room and decided to put Maria to bed for the time being. Maria was sleeping very deeply, and there was absolutely no sign of her eyes opening. For now, we'd get some soft drinks out of the room's refrigerator and drink those while playing cards or something. Knock, knock! Oh, Cannon? And you're here too, Genji. What has happened with tonight's shift? Kraus has given an order. He made some sizable changes to the shift schedule. Indeed. Goda now has the night shift at the mansion. Shannon and Cannon have the night shift in the guest house. Kumasawa and I have an order to sleep in the guest house. Just now, a phone call came, saying that once you arrived, you were also to remain here for the rest of the night. Huh? That certainly is a sizable change. The shifts at the guest house and the mansion have been completely reversed, haven't they? Originally, Shannon and Cannon had been assigned the night shift in the mansion, while the night shift in the guest house, where all of the relatives were staying, had been assigned to Goda, who had an abundance of ac experience in entertaining. Kumasawa should have been sweeping at the guest house, while Genji should have been sweeping in the mansion. However, it seemed that Kraus had suddenly ordered that the schedule be modified. The shifts at the guest house and the mansion had all been reversed, and Genji was spending the night in the guest house. It's probably because of Beatrice's letter. Why probably? After such a mysterious letter appeared, it was only natural that Kraus would suspect one of us. We served directly under the master, so Kraus tried as best as he could to keep us far away from the family conference. Genji, Shannon, and Cannon were all permitted to wear the Ushiromiya family crest, the one-winged e eagle, as the servants who served directly under Kinzo. Of course, since they were working for the Ushiromiya family, they had to obey anyone's orders, but their only boss was Kinzo. Since only Kinzo held the right to employ them, even Kraus could not have dismissed the could not have them dismissed of his own accord. Because of this, Kraus and the, and the others often viewed these servants as Kinzo's underlings and shunned them. And in fact, Kinzo seldom let anyone other than them enter his study. The sudden shift change was probably a clear expression of the sense of mistrust that it caused. Considering the time Kinzo had left to live, this would definitely be the last family conference before the problem of the inheritance came up. On top of that, the mysterious letter that claimed to be from Beatrice had dropped in out of the blue. Kraus definitely wanted to keep Kinzo's loyal subjects away from the table of such a delicate and important discussion. If you would excuse me, I will go to rest. If anything happens, call me immediately. Our guest tonight is a special case, after all. Yes, certainly, Genji. I don't know who was talking there, but you can say both were, okay? Because it was kind of a mix. Genji nodded back. Sorry, my head was shaking. It does that sometimes. I don't know if it's a mental disorder or if I have Down Syndrome, which is a mental disorder, so I don't fucking know. Genji nodded back, went behind a screen, took off his jacket, and slowly began to relax after a day's worth of tension. The ones who returned just now, were they the children? Yes. The other relatives are having a conference in the mansion. It looks like it would drag on for quite some time. Then we've got it easy. It's already this late and there's this weather. The rest of the relatives will probably spend the night in their rooms at the mansion. Yes, probably. I'm only saying this because Genji isn't around, but I'm a little happy I was sent to the guest house, I guess. Oh. Why's that? Because you can stay away from Madame and Eva, those bullies? Or do you have another reason? It's not as though I have uh, another reason. I see. Then let's do our best tonight, best together with our night shift. I'm counting on you, Shannon. Uh, um, just now I was asked to go to the children's room and play with them. Shannon hung her head apologetically, gazing at Cannon uncertainly. Cannon didn't try to meet her eyes and spoke curtly as he sighed. It looked like he didn't plan on indul indulging his sister. You can't. You were assigned to the night shift. Besides which, it isn't necessary for furniture like us to respond to an invitational invitation to play. You understand, right? Yes, I do understand. <sighs> Shannon's shoulders drooped slightly. She had already expected that Cannon, a stickler for rules, would say something like that, but still she seemed a little discouraged. As Cannon flipped through a logbook, she... Oh, Cannon, duh. As Cannon flipped through a logbook, he spoke without facing Shannon. That means the children will be waiting for you. You have to apologize and tell them you have the night shift and won't be able to stay with them. Go and come back. 
Huh? Ah, uh, yes! I'll go apologize and come back. Shannon hurriedly stood from her seat before her brother's mood could change and flew out of the servant room after giving a quick bow. As he watched her go, Cannon took a single deep breath. Genji's voice came from beyond the screen. Cannon, I will be here so you can go too. Genji? Shannon was the only one called. It's not as though I was invited. That is only because you were not there at the time. If you had been, you would have been invited as well. It is good to play as a child from time to time. No, such a thing is not necessary for me. Human children may have a need to play, but we are furniture. Is that so? Shannon is also furniture. Even if she pretends to be a person, it will only hurt her later. I understand that, so I try not to get too close to people. That's all. Genji did not say anything after that. After a while, he stood up and used a pot of hot water to make powdered cocoa, serving some to Cannon as well. Is that for real? I had no clue. Dumbass, you're too loud. You wake Maria up. Batwer was so surprised that he yelled obnoxiously and scattered his cards everywhere. His voice caused Maria to turn over once, but soon she fell back into a deep sleep. Jessica gave him a jab and he lowered his voice. Still seriously, now that you mention it, they really did have that kind of atmosphere, didn't they? Ha, <laughs> now I see. So George is... George couldn't be seen anywhere in the room. A short while ago, when Shannon came into the room, George suddenly said that he'd forgotten something in the mansion and needed to go back and get it. Shannon said she would guide him, just like she had on the way to the guest house, and the two of them departed together. Well, there's actually been signs of it for a while now. You know, questions about hobbies and favorite things. I always thought it was a bit much for passing interest, and look what's happened now. Come to think of it, I get the feeling George's always been overly nice to Shannon. Now I get it. Yeah, that basically implies George and Shannon like each other. Go fucking figure, right? And I can only assume that this is them walking together. Um, excuse me, but where the fuck? According to the weather report, it looks like it'll be at its worst tonight. It also seems it'll last all day tomorrow, though it should get a little better. Really? Then maybe the boat won't arrive until the day after tomorrow. I hope that doesn't interfere with your work on Monday. Ha ha ha, I already knew the typhoon would be coming beforehand. Just in case, I made sure I didn't have any plans for Monday, so it's okay. I may not look it, but I really am the type who can plan ahead in his schedule. George puffed out his chest, acting proud. Ha! Huh. <laughs> Compared to the calm appearance George always had as the oldest cousin, he now looked amusingly like a little kid. Shannon chuckled at this abrupt contrast. It's no surprise you're so well prepared, as someone who will bring prosperity to his company someday. Well, making a company prosper is really a tough job. Money isn't the only thing that's important. I learned that well when studying under my father. Making a company prosper is like owning a castle and leading your subordinates. My dad really loves reading about great leaders during the warring periods of Japan, a hobby that's probably influenced by the fact that he shares Toyotomi Hideyoshi's name. Much of his philosophy on managing businesses comes from talking about them. Fuck, I can't speak. Did you know? Takeda Shingen, who was feared as the leader of the strongest cavalry corps in the warring periods, started out with his troops in complete disarray. They didn't have the, the kind of strong leadership necessary to utilize them well. Is that true? That's a little unexpected. In order to unite his troops, Shingen showed his excellent leadership in many ways. For example, when a soldier succeeded well in battle, he would immediately honor them with a medal. Normally, that kind of thing was put off until after the war, and they were all awarded at once. He continued this diligently while on the field of battle, and immediately showing his appreciation for his troops' military exploits motivated them in an extremely significant fashion. Also, whenever one of his troops was brought down by an illness, he would be the first to rush up to them and care for them, and so on. Takeda Shingen wasn't just the man who led the strongest cavalry corps in the... corps in the warring period. I think it's corps, actually, so I'm stupid. He was the person who cared the most for his troops throughout that area. And because he was that kind of person, all of his troops went along with him. The truth was, Shannon had already heard this story several years ago. But whenever a discussion of his father led to this sort of topic, George would always glow and look like he was having a great time. So Shannon just smiled without interrupting, urging him to continue. Of course, in a capitalist world, money determines both your strength and the height of your fortifications. But you can't build up a castle or succeed in war by yourself. Such things can only be accomplished with the support of many subordinates, by borrowing their strength. 
After understanding this, when I look at my father's back, I realize how immature I am. I can clearly see how much competition he had to overcome before building up all he has now. George, you really do look up to your father. I'm jealous. Ah, oh, sorry, that's not how I meant it. I'm sorry, that's not how I meant it either. The two of them awkwardly looked at their feet. Shannon had no parents. She had been brought up in an orphanage owned by Kinzo called the Fuqueen House. Under the guidance of Kinzo, their honorary director, honorary director, the orphanage offered members who excelled a chance who excelled a chance for on-the-job serving experience. If their efforts met with Kinzo's approval, they'd be able to leave the orphanage and work as servants for the Ushiromiya family. This was considered to be the highest honor for those who lived in the orphanage. Servants from the Fukuin house all took names with the character On in them while they served. So Shannon wasn't her real name. The same went for Canon. All of the members of the Fukuin house were orphans. I said Fukuin this time. At least they were all people who had been separated from their parents under special circumstances. Because of this, the orphans had been taught to think of each other as their only family. That's why it seemed so natural to both of them when Cannon called Shannon his sister. And while both Shannon and Cannon were working in the mansion today, there were several other servants possessing the On character, was that it? On character in their names? Such as Manon and Lenin, who often worked in a rotation schedule. However, there were not many servants who stayed with the Ushiromiya family for long. It was standard for them to quit after three years. So you could probably say that Shannon, who had been working for ten years, was a notable exception to the rule. Working as a servant for the Ushiromiya family was a heavy burden to bear, but the pay wasn't bad at all. Working for a full three years would earn more than what was needed to enter mainstream society. That was why, even though the orphans realized what a harsh task working for the Ushiromiya, Ushiromiya family was, they still hoped to be accepted. Maybe the fact that Shannon managed to continue working for 10 years wasn't because she had more willpower than the other servants. Maybe she'd gotten stuck working for 10 years because she didn't have the courage to say she wanted to quit. Kinzo couldn't even trust his own blood relatives, and these excellent servants sent from the Fukuin house were the only ones he could rely on. Because of that, Kinzo would sometimes allow them to wear the family crest, as servants under his direct control, and have them work close to him. Er, um, you've been working here for almost 10 years now, right? You must have saved up a lot of money by now. I wonder. It's not like there's anything in particular I'd like to buy. After all, a few million yen isn't enough to live off for the rest of your life. So the reason you've been working all this time wasn't to hit some target sum? Yes, that's right. I have nowhere to go outside this mansion. And I have been getting along well with my lady and the other young servants. The madame does scold me sometimes, but caring for the roses and cleaning the mansion is fun. But that can't be your entire life, Shannon. No. Sayo. Sayo, okay. I forgot that was her name. Um. Shannon cast her eyes downward when she heard her real name. She understood what George was trying to say and fell silent. There's something I've learned as I continue to study even after becoming an adult and a full-fledged member of society. A human's life is not as monotonous or short as we thought when we were kids. All school-aged kids have certain fears they can't shake. They wonder whether they'll live the rest of their lives like sleepy classes after a monotonous and boring school day. Spending their time in, in a carefree laziness without anything interesting happening until it's all over. However, life's only like that for underage students. Compared to a human's life, the time they spend as students is nothing more than a blink of the eye. A period where they break through the shells of their immaturity. The inside of the shell might be a hot, suffocating, and boring world. But the world beyond that shell is vast and filled with limitless possibilities. So far, your life has been trapped inside the shell called Shannon. I think you're under the mistaken impression that your life will continue like this forever. That's... Shannon couldn't deny those words. She'd been unable to harbor any queer doubts about her lifestyle. And since she never had any hope or goals for changing herself, she'd lazily continued living the way she always had. And if asked whether this life was satisfying, she wouldn't have been able to nod. She may have been intentionally averting her eyes from the truth. Without George's admonishments, she would have continued pretending not to notice as her real life slipped away bit by bit, neglected. George, is it wrong for me to continue living this way? Yeah, it is. Oh, and by the way, didn't you break one of your one of our rules just now? George immediately gave a strict answer, then broke out into a mischievous smile. Shannon already knew what she had been what she was being chided for, and she hung her fuck. <laughs> and she hung her head again, apparently embarrassed. Didn't you promise not to use Sama when the two of us are alone? I couldn't obey that as a promise. But if it was an order, I would have to obey it, because I'm furniture. 
Then it's an order. Um, yes. Certainly, George. As Shannon hung her, hung her head, her face red, she said George's name again, this time following it with Sans! Hey guys, wrong game! Yes, that's fine, Sayo. George smiled at Shannon, no, Sayo, to praise her small act of bravery. Aw, ship it, wall. The short exchange alone made it clear how far back the relationship must have stretched. For a long while, the two talked as if the weather raging about them didn't even enter their thoughts. They talked about the many memories they'd built during their relationship that no one else knew about. Every once in a while, a flash of lightning would attempt to interrupt them, but this could sully neither the roses nor the time they spent blushing at each other. Aw, isn't that cute? Shatter! 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 Uh, shatter? Okay, no. That's right. I have something I want to show you. What could it be? I I've been going for a while now, but I'm just gonna keep going. George, who had been speaking eloquently, suddenly started to stutter. Watching him, Shannon seemed to guess something. George timidly searched through his pocket. Something got caught in the depths of his pocket, and just like the stuttering George, it took a little while to get it out. It was a very small box. A small box covered in a deep blue velvet. Ooh! That peculiar shape was enough to tell anyone what was resting inside. I don't remember this shit! Shannon had prepared her heart somewhat, certain beforehand that this was what he'd been planning. But even so, when she actually saw it, she couldn't avoid blushing once more. George opened the small box, took something out, and held it out for Shannon to take. I want you to take this. I, um, couldn't accept something so valuable. You can't take it? No, um... I'm unworthy of such a thing. Sayo, this isn't a request. It's an order. Take this ring, okay? Uh, if it's an order, I can't fuck. I cannot disobey. <laughs> I cannot I, I've been clicking the right arrow key too many times this episode. Yeah, that's right. Well done. Shannon, not wanting to show her bright red face, timidly accepted the ring from George's hand while still staring at the ground. That ring wasn't a simple accessory. It was a noble object, meant since ancient times to be offered to a special woman under cer special circumstances. Therefore, while George could order her to take it, he could not order anything beyond that. Anything beyond that would depend not on an order, but on Shannon's, no, Sayo's own will. So from here on, I'm not ordering you anymore. Sayo, I want you to give me your answer by tomorrow, without using words. Do you understand? Er, uh, how should I... I won't order you any further, so this isn't an order. But a ring is something you put on your finger, after all. If you like it, you can just put it on any finger you choose. Shannon had only pretended not to know. She already understood what he wanted her to do. But she was standing at a huge crossroads of her life. Look how late it's gotten. Let's call it a day. George turned away from Shannon, acting just a bit bluntly. I could probably order you to wear it on your left hand. You might be timid and dependent enough to actually obey that kind of an order. But I want at least this last step to be done by your own will, Sayo. Understand? Y yes So, that's my order. I want you to think about it well tonight, and show me your answer tomorrow. Shannon nodded back. Today was the culmination of their many days spent together. Hey guys, did you forget this is a horror visual novel? Huh, I wonder what's gonna happen. These two lovebirds at the beginning of a story where people obviously die and no one's died yet? Huh, wonder, hmm, I wonder, I definitely wonder, I guess I don't know what's gonna happen at all. This moment certainly hadn't come as a surprise to Shannon. We should be getting back to the guest house soon. If we take any longer, we'll make everyone worry about us. Oh, um, I'm sorry, I, um, I just remembered something I had to do in the mansion, so, uh, I have to go back to the mansion. At a time like this? Is that true? George stared into Shannon's face as he laughed mischievously. He definitely saw through Shannon's lie. I mean, she stutters over, like, every word, so that wouldn't make sense. However, when he saw how she felt, he could sort of understand that she might be so embarrassed that she'd want to be alone. So because George realized the meaning behind Shannon's lie, he accepted it. And off he goes, back to the guest house. And shatter. Yeah, yeah, there. Uh, my timing was off, but hey, I was correct. Ooh, what time is it? It is 11 p.m. Or, as the Japanese would call it, 2300!
Aren't I funny man? All right. That went a little longer than I wanted it to, and still no one's dead yet. Jeez, time passes super slow in this game, but hey, it's fine or something. I don't fucking know or care, so with that being said, that's going to be it for this episode. If you liked it, be sure to press the like button, and if you didn't like it, fuck you too. Remember to subscribe, follow me on Twitter, and hit that notification bell to stay up to date on all my videos and stuff. And as always, my name is Godzi, and I will see you all next time. Goodbye!